Welcome everyone back to the Crimson 15 Podcast. I'm your host, Crimson. And 15 PCA. Native 454. Be sure to check us out over on Twitter at C15 Podcast. So we're up to episode 11 of She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. And I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm shocked. I don't know. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but this is an actually a good episode. Not just a good episode for She-Ra. It's actually just a good story in general. I, I didn't think they had it in them. They did it, it, maybe this is just the one time, but they actually had character development, a good plot, uh, interesting storytelling devices. It's almost like they cared. I, 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 okay, we're going to just jump right into the episode, and it opens up with uh, where we ended last time, uh, with the door finding the, the temple, or uh, citadel, I don't know what they're calling it here, but it's a... Uh, the place where she's going to try to learn more about what it is to be Shira. So she finds like a door and she gets it open and she goes underground. Catcher's been, been you know, tracking her from behind and she sneaks in there with her. Apparently this is a language. They actually, uh, remember, I don't know who tweeted it out, but it was someone from the show saying all these little sim- symbols actually make real words. So I wonder if there's someone out there actually deciphered all this stuff. But, um, you know, they're walking around and there's uh, no talking or anything. She's just kind of looking around trying to figure out what she needs to do. Because this, to a door, all of it's familiar, but it's also foreign to her. So she's trying to still figure everything out. She becomes she after talking to that, uh, oh, oh, uh, that little hologram thing. That's like, oh, uh, give me a query. It's just that very kind of, I don't like the technology part of it. I like everything better when it was just magical, but they're doing this weird kind of like, it's alien tech. It's, eh, I don't know. She becomes she and she starts talking to it. It, it uh, recognizes her as an administrator. An administrator? Is it? Okay, it's not it's not Windows XP. You don't have to, do, you know, run program as a minister. You don't, you don't need to do that. It's, I, I think it's unnecessary to add this technology part to it, but I don't know. I guess some people might like that. So she's trying to talk to it like, hey, how do I heal stuff? And they're like, oh, you know, unrecognized. Then she's like getting, she got frustrated too quickly. Like Adora, whenever something doesn't work out for her, she just seems to get really like, I don't know. She gets that easily frustrated. And it was only after like one question, like, come on. And it's asking for questions, not for vague statements. Then she kind of gets it talking and she's like, oh, okay, uh, is that something I can do is heal stuff? And it's like, oh, sure, one of the many powers is, you know, healing, the, correcting the balance, which isn't necessary as, necessarily the same thing as healing. And I think that just flew right over her head because she's so uh, caught up in wanting to learn how to heal so she can help her friend. Catcher's just, you know, watching, being smart, not interfering, just looking around. And uh, Shira has like a flashback and she sees... Um, uh, she's seeing a vision, and she's like, "Oh, I need to talk to Light Hope." And uh, I don't, I don't think she even knows who that is. But in her that little flashback, she knows it's someone important. And then the computer stops talking like a computer, and it's like, "Oh, you will, you get to meet her, but she's here. You, you just can't meet her right now." I'm like, huh? What? Why is it talking to me like that? She doesn't. She's like getting again more frustrated with it, and. Catra sees like one of the, like a little gem chip thingy in the wall. She pulls it off and it starts that alarm, that whole thing that happened the last time. And they start getting attacked by like these spider robots and they, they, they take off running. Uh, they're not going to, this little, there is problems. I, even though I said this is actually a really good episode, there is a couple of problems and I will point them out. Uh, this run animation here is pretty ridiculous. Like it, if you see it in motion, it's really bad, but uh, they're running away from these spider bots and, they're saving each other. And of course, Catra just can't stand. Oh, yeah, they don't need you to help me and all that kind of stuff. And they keep going back and forth. But they, they're going to need each other because they have to survive these giant uh, robot spiders. And, you know, they're having arguments going back and forth. It's a little it's a little childish the way that they're arguing with each other. And But I guess, I don't know, I guess that makes sense. Uh, she turns her sword into to a shield and like breaks the hallway so the kind of little mini cave in just to block all the, the robots from getting to him. She powers down back to her door and they're talking and of course it's that weird back and forth because they're still friends. They're still, you know, helping each other but they kind of dislike each other, especially on Catra's side. It's almost I if Adora, you know, had Catra join her side, she would like completely accept her. 
but I don't think it would be the other way around with Catra. She's already to a point where she's at a tipping point where she needs to choose between doing what she thinks is right and what she feels is right, which is usually never the same thing sometimes. It's just, she you can see she's dealing with that because she still cares about her. And then she even kind of like, you know, like, oh, you know, you know, you like me. <laughs> Getting all kind of like uh, chummy with each other, I guess. And, you know, of course, Catra denies it. There's a lot of uh, tension between them this whole entire episode, which is really good, which is something I actually like. Um, the sword right here is completely off. It's off the... If, if the sword had a character sheet, it's off model. It looks really, really tiny and dumb. But I never... I think I've only mentioned this during the first episode, but the music is actually really good in this series. And they're just walking along. They're not talking and the music is playing. It's actually... It sets the mood very well. I can't believe I'm... I, I like this. This... Uh, and they're walking around. We see some more of that writing, which I... And they said it's actual writing. It'd be cool to know what these... These uh, murals or whatever, what they actually say. They come to a dead end. And Catra keeps trying to find excuses to split up and go her own way. But everything's kind of like a one-way thing, so they might as well walk together. You know, she speaks friend and open and enter, and they open the door by saying uh, Eternia. They end up in a, a like a pitch black room. Like, it's like infinite voidness. She walks up to a little red crystal or light or something, and then it... The light, the lights in the room come on, and they're like in the fright zone. Like, what, what the hell? They never explain... What exactly is happening? But uh, but uh, my speculation, what I'm thinking is that this is almost like a uh, a test or like a trial she has to go through. But she even grabs Catch. She's like, "What the hell? Are you you tricking me? What's going on?" But think about it. How the hell would she have done this to you? You're in this citadel of Shira for all she knows. How could she manipulate it this way? But it, you know, she's trying to make sense of everything. Then you know. Uh, they start looking around, seeing what's going on, and then Catcher walks up to a guard, and the guard isn't answering her, and she sees that it's just like a hologram. So this is a um, like a hollow deck from freaking Star Trek, and we see little baby Catra, like, oh look how cute she is, and it's like replaying memories, and then we see baby. Uh, when I say baby, I mean they're like little kids. We see uh, little kid Catra and little kid Adora, and they're just absolutely adorable. These two, and we see that. Catra's like running up to her door. Oh, I hurt my hand. I think I'm cut. And, you know, and we can kind of see that relationship. I, I even said this, how when the her other teammates, I forget which episode it was. She's like, oh, Adora's not here to protect you. I am like, oh, yeah, Adora must have been the one to always stick up for her. But in the same time, by standing up for her, she never allowed Catra to stand up for herself. It, it came from a place of love. But it, it to Catra, it always felt like, you don't trust me to be strong on my own. But it's it's so hard when you're wanting to protect a friend. This is a good episode. Did I say that? It actually has deep thoughts and feelings. It's actually, uh, I want to overanalyze things in a positive way. But um, we're seeing this memory play out in front of them. And I guess she picked a fight with Octavia. Not not the one from My Little Pony, but an octopus. <laughs> her name's Octavia. She like, you know, oh, I scratched her eye and called her a stupid face and all that kind of stuff. And then... Adora goes down there and she does the same thing because I guess they were, you know, these two are thick as thieves. They were, they were, they were super best besties. And I, I have to admit, Adora have missing her front teeth. It's like super crazy adorable. Like she could, she could sell, you know, pancakes and something like that, like in a commercial. She's just like super adorable. Then they have that. And it's funny, the, the memories playing out in front of them and then they run off laughing together and then it goes back to them actually holding hands and running like they were when they're kids so are they acting out this memory and because why would they be running and laughing just like they were when they're little kids and then they're you know they're they're happy uh catcher pulls her hand away and she's like oh you know because she's getting all like uh, defensive again but they just had the, the, that, that fun memory together and then of course they start arguing again back and forth and she's like you know i want to go my own way uh you know leave me alone they keep walking and they, there's like this little bridge in the middle of the thing and a door slips and Catra grabs her. And so you can tell they do care about each other. I think Catra has a romantic physical love for Adora and Adora has a I love you as my sister kind of love. And I, they don't I don't they don't explore that, but I think that could have been another dynamic that they could have done which the the story's fine without it, but I think that could have added that little extra layer of you know, seriousness in a show that has been pretty damn silly up to this episode. You know, they they keep talking, and then they even mentioned like, was it was it was it all bad? 
in the fright zone. And of course, she's like, no, it wasn't. We had good memories. And you can see that they kind of reminisce on that. But then, even though they both experience these things together, I think Adora remembers them differently than how Catra remembers them. Something that might be a good memory for Adora, that in Catra's mind, that was like another moment, another part of her life where Adora showed that she's number one and put me in my place and made sure that I was number two. That was never the intention, but I just think that we get a lot of that tension between these two. Then, uh, and then she's like, they get a little playful. They're like, oh yeah, you know, I'm not going to leave you alone to you. Admit that you like me. We had fun together. And they're like play fighting, like probably like they used to do when they were kids. And she falls through a platform, you know, <laughs> three, nine and four quarters, but she falls in through a pillar and it brings them into another memory. And this is the scene that was in that first trailer. And it, even then, I think when we reviewed that trailer, I'm like, they look different in this scene is because they're actually younger. And they're having like that little fight with the with the sticks and everything. And it, it's an okay fight. It's not it's nothing too dynamic, but it's pretty decent. Catra is it shows her using uh being manipulated to live. Uh Adore's winning, and then she does like oh like pretending she's hurt, and of course Adore's always going to protect her friend. And she's that's always been something about her. It's been part of her character through her whole life. And she was using that just to feign, to fake her out, and gets her on the ground. And I guess this was a uh, big team battle. Uh, I for, uh, what's her Lonnie was that her name something with an L then she starts attacking um, Katra and so she ends up having to fight two opponents at once so she she takes out Lonnie but then when she turns around Katra uh, not Katra but Adora's uh, up and going boom knocks her out so Adora wins the match and you know hooray Adora you, you showed that you're the best best warrior you're the best fighter and um, this blue guy this art is pathetic the, the, this, the, the character design on this guy this the detail is some of the worst. Him and then that hairy guy from the other episode is pretty awful. But we cut back to uh, all of them as kids. I guess they, they grew up and trained together since they were toddlers. So we see uh, Kyle. He didn't do anything pathetic this time. His patheticness happened off screen. And then, you know, she's like, oh, Lonnie, you had a double team me. And she's like, yeah, you were playing dirty, which she was. But you're the bad guys. And guess what? In a battle... There are no rules. You don't. You don't have to. There's. It's not Queensberry rules where you have to take turns and all that. No. In a fight for your life, you, you do everything you can. You lie. Sh- you know, steal, kill, deception, everything. So I think Catcher was actually doing the right thing, G- knowing her enemy, knowing that Adora would let her guard down if she feigned an injury. So yeah, I actually I'm on Catcher's side. But Catcher is like, oh yeah, I let you win, and you know if I won, they would expect things of me, and then you know of course the door is like being playful with their like, oh yeah, you know I beat you. The rest of them like, oh we're gonna look, and again everyone's super cute, even the lizard guy, look how cute he is. When then we cut back to I guess is the part of the memory that Adora wasn't a part of. Uh, Catcher goes to the locker room and she's upset, she's crying, she's like. You, she did want to win. She does want to prove that she's good enough, but she just can't express her feelings. And then she probably bottled these feelings up for a decade. Probably ever since, you know, it's just hard for her to express her feelings. And again, another great storytelling element here. Kid Catra is crying, looking in the mirror, and she looks up. She's it's adult Catra. So when these these memories are playing out, are they acting them out? And us as the viewer are seeing the little kid versions. But they also saw the little kid versions. It's very mysterious and trying to figure it out. I don't think we need to figure it out. But I like it. it it's a, it's another cool story element. And she kind of freaks out because she's had, reliving those those memories again. Then one of those spider bots like breaks through the window that was the fake window in the uh, hologram. And uh, she starts getting caught by uh, the spider spits like some web on her and grabs her. And I've seen way too many animes to know what happens after you get wrapped up by a bunch of webs by some type of monster. Never anything good happens. So Cat, uh, Catcher's getting pulled in and the door is trying to save her. She gets pulled through and then we get, again, a, a, I think it's a, Catcher gets kind of like a hero moment here. She's she's calling out for a door. You can hear her mouth muffled. She's caught up and she starts crying because you know what? She can't get out of the situation. She thinks, I'm going to freaking get killed. She calms down, you know, steal yourself, get put your courage in the sticking place. She breaks out of the webs and she fights her way out. She didn't need anyone to come and save her. She uses her agility to her advantage, gets on top of this uh, spider bot. The only thing I dislike here is she's busting this thing up with her bare hands. I can understand maybe breaking one of the eyes because maybe it's glass or something, but she literally starts ripping off the panels and everything. And I don't know. I would have done something different there. 
But she's beating this thing up and beating it. And she kind of has that look of, uh, yeah, I, I got you. And she kind of beat it. And Adora comes in and delivers the final blow. She just stabbed it in the head. And we kind of see that dismissive nature of Adora. And Catcher's like, oh, I had this. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure you did, Catcher. Keep thinking you're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saved you again because that's what I do for you. A little condescending. A little uh, dismissive. And we start to feel for Catra. Maybe all those memories weren't so good. Maybe all those times that she did stand up for her. It, in Catra's eyes, she, she, she kind of sees it as a way of like, oh, you were just, bo bo you helped me, but it was to boost yourself. And of course, that was never the intention of Adora. It just, that's how it kind of played out. Adora's trying to, you know, you know, tell her, you know, you don't have to go back. Just come with, just come with me. I think she could have tried a little bit harder. I think she's stupid to the fact that Catra is like in love with her because I'm pretty sure if she would have said come to the rebellion you can be with me it will be you and me we'll you know uh me and you will be together if I think if she would have played that angle if, of course she shouldn't lie to her to get her to join the team but if she honestly felt that way I'm pretty sure Catra would have joined the team but she doesn't want to just you know she also wants to prove herself like oh when you left I, I it was it was my opportunity to grow without you because everything I did was always with you right next to me so you know they they see another memory and they're having like a little race and they're running around like uh swinging through the corridors and everything and look at look at look at that little cute face it's just a little little kid adora is like super adorable so they're like running after each other just having fun being little kids and they see uh shadow reaver's room the doors open and and this is an, uh, just, this is just another good scene Adult Adora or older Adora and older Catra, she and he looks. She looks at. Her, she's like Catra. You don't have to go in that room because you know something bad happened in there. And she's almost like you don't have to go live that memory again. We can. We don't have to go in there. So I'm like, oh, again, that's so good. They go in there. and They're looking at the crystal, and it kind of shocked uh, Catra. It's kind of like licking a nine volt. It kind of shocks her. And and then we see shadow reaver come in the room and she almost i don't know, like when i watch him like she comes in like oh what did i what did i do last night she's like she looks like she's drunk but i'm pretty sure she's low on power energy or hordak just punished her for something and we see she takes off her mask and i'm not going to show the screenshot it's pretty freaking scary and like really highly detailed watch the episode because i don't want to ruin that for you but they get to see pretty much what her face looks like and let's just say uh, there's a reason why she wears the mask she sees them in there and she's, what are you guys doing in here? You know, and they're getting in trouble. And the only one who looks like he's going to get punished is Catra. She, you know, uh, Shadow Reaver freezes her in place. And she's like, oh, you've been nothing but a nuisance. And I, I expected this kind of behavior from you. But if you bring a door down with you, you know, I'll basically, she doesn't say it, but pretty much I will kill you. Like, I'll get rid of you. And we see this is a child. And Catra is scared at completely. She thinks she's going to be killed. And Adora runs up there. No, this it was both our plans. And we see that Shadow Reaver loves Adora like a daughter. And Catra was like her misbehaving pet. That's that's exactly how she saw their relationship together. Which is awful and terrible. She didn't see them as even sisters or equals. She only saw them as like my favorite favorite daughter and her stupid pet. Then she talks to... Um, she's again you know, going on to Catra. Basically telling her I'm going to kill you. If you do this kind of crap again. And we see that fear. We see that desperation in her eyes. He, that is a, a defining moment. This this moment lives in Catra's mind every day of her life. I can guarantee it. And then that that has shaped her character. This negative, horrible experience has defined her. And then when you have everyone in her life has defining moments, and this is one of those moments where she took it and she didn't allow it to help her become better. She let it keep her bitter and. I, I can see that that's why her character acts the way she does. Again, did I say this episode's really good? It is so good. Then Adora goes to protect her, saying, no, 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 don't don't blame all her. It's, it was me too. And Shadow Weaver is talking to Adora the same way she should have talked to both of them. Oh, you know, it's okay. Like Kind of like being a little bit way more nicer to her. And I love this stuff right here. Like when they're walking and it shows the two children walking out and when they pass by a pillar, it's adult or older Adora and older Catra. So it's like, did they act out that scene? I just kind of want to see both sides of that. It's a very interesting uh, transition in the storytelling thing. It's it's just really good. And, you know, we get that scene and, you know, she's like, they have to live it. And they keep going back and forth. 
and they're having a conversation. They're little kid versions of them. Then they're teenager versions of them and they're saying the same words. And she's like, no, I never meant to make it, make you feel that way. I didn't, I didn't, I thought I was helping you. I was there to protect you. And it just keeps going back and forth. It is just a great scene. It's been done in other things, but it's, it feels so good to see something like this in a show that has disappointed me basically all the way through. And it's just cool. You definitely watch. If you only watch one episode of the series, this, this is it so far. And you know they're 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 still fighting and going back and forth, and I love the dynamic of switching between teenagers and kids, and they're still having those feelings. And she's like, you know, I'm the better force captain than you'll ever be. And uh, Adora's like, what are you talking about, Catcher? You've always told me you never cared about being in command. You always told me you didn't care about getting the praise. And then she just admits it to her. You, what are you, an idiot? Of course I wanted to be praised. Of course I wanted to be number one. Of course I wanted people to look at me and think I was great. And then. You know, this is a revelation for Adora. So, what do you mean? Like, oh, well, well, I'm sorry. I, I honestly didn't know that's how you felt. And, and all these feelings come pouring out. And she's like, why did you give me the sword? If you felt this way, why did you give me back my sword? You know, during Princess Princess Prom. Literally, these two episodes couldn't be any more different. Princess Prom was one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my life. And this is like actually really good. And she... Like drops a bomb on her if this is true or not but she's like i gave you the sword so you we wouldn't capture you and bring you back because i didn't want you to come back you can get your sword and go and leave and be with your friends and this is like a like a dagger in the heart because she always even though they were enemies this whole time she always kind of had that well catcher still cared about me adore she cared about my well-being and she didn't want to see me get hurt that's why she gave me the sword no she gave it to me to make sure i stayed away oh that's a that is a gut bomb right there that just gets you and she's trying to get her to come back and, you know, she doesn't. She just walks away from her. And then those spider things start attacking Adora. Tries to turn to Shira, Doesn't get to. It knocks a, knocks a sword out of her hand and Catcher takes off running. And we see a bunch of little mini memories fly by. And th- th- that's cool. I love that. It's, just, it's a literal running away from your past and a metaphorical running away from your past. That's actually good storytelling. They actually did it. She runs and then she gets to another memory. And this is must when they were really, really little because they actually look like almost toddlers. She's in a in the barracks and we see she sees herself as a little kid wrapped up in a blanket and Adora walks up to her. She's like, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be with you. It's going to be you and me always. And then even teenage Adora's like, you know, we, you're going to stay. You, you promise. And she has that look in her eye like, you promised me then. I think that's when she like bonded with her like she completely was in love with adora from like when they first were just little little kids she always cared about her and but she felt that in the beginning she wanted that protection she wanted that person to stand up for me but i guess as they grew older it became more of a source of resentment not a source of strength or a source of she she it's there's so much in this episode there's so many ways to interpret it i i actually love break see everyone says i nitpick everything but when something's good i love to talk about things that are good and there's a lot of good to see in this and it's just like a heartbreaking moment where they're walking hand in hand as little kids they're just so freaking cute then little girl catcher looks over at teenage catcher and they just kind of look at each other and then she turns away and walks away and then this is this is the moment she has a sad look on her face because it is sad you imagine seeing a little kid you and you're seeing a moment that that was a defining moment in your life and this is where inside her mind she has a choice. Catra can let these things that happened help her grow and become a stronger, better person or let it make her bitter, make her angry. And she gets a look in her face like, damn, Catra learned the wrong lesson. She she took the wrong path. She took the path of anger, the path of vengeance, the path of letting things hold you back. It's just, ugh, I, I, I wanted her to, to succeed in this situation. We cut to Doris fighting those spider bots and she's she's losing. She grabs the sword by the blade again. I freaking hate that. She's getting she's getting beat. She's getting turned upside down and they're going to dump, dump her in a freaking pit. And she's trying to fight this thing and she's going to fall. She holds on to it and she hears Catra. So Catra like destroys all these freaking spider bots. Like beats them to hell. She sees Catra. Oh, thank God you're, you're here. Can you know, help? Can you please help me? And we see kind of Catra went off the, the deep end. She She's... She chose the path of hatred, the path of anger, you know, Yoda pop in there, you know, anger, hate, and, you know, all destruction, all that. And she's just being kind of, kind of a little crazy. 
she's like oh you know this uh the sword and I, would it work for me i doubt it will and she's just kind of like swinging it around and she sees she sees a door down like about to fall in the pit very lion king-ish and she's just you know just walking around and she puts the sword on the ground and starts to drag it and she's like you know i i didn't need you this is uh i get to be so much better without you i wish you would have left earlier and it's, it's, it's breaking a door's heart because she knows deep down inside they're true friends they truly do care for each other they've been through so much together and for it to end this way it, it must really completely broke her heart and you know cash is just you know just has that crazy look in her eye and that that dead emotion where it's like if i feel nothing then i don't have to feel sad i don't have to feel uh remorse i don't have to feel bad for what i'm about to do so i won't feel anything and that that's no way to live you can't live that way but she just has that dead look in her eyes and it's so it's such a cool look for it it when i say character development doesn't always mean they develop and become better. She literally developed and became worse. Not in the fact of a bad character, but a bad person in the context of the show. So she cuts the, the little things that were holding her and she falls onto a rock. And she's like, you know, don't do this. You know, you don't have to go back there. You can come with me, be here, be on my side. And of course, Catcher's already made her decision. She already decided in her mind, I'm going to be, you're going to be good. I'm going to be bad. You're yin, I'm yang. And that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, we see the simulation breaking down behind her and we get that heartbreak moment. She's like, I can't believe it. I lost her. I, when she left the Fright Zone and Ke she left, basically left Catcher behind, she kind of, I bet you she always felt that, you know, when I get there, when the rebellion, you know, finally wins, I can, I can turn her. She can be my friend again. But in this moment, she's like, I lost my friend forever. We're, when we meet again. We're going to have to freaking kill each other. That, that, that's probably what we're going to end up having to do. And it, it broke her heart it, because they're friends. Uh, Catcher ended up throwing the, the sword down the pit. And she's just there like she doesn't know what to do. The door is like, oh, am I going to die? She looks up and sees um, Light Hope. Light Hope? Is that her name? Sees her. And from the beginning, like when she said in the beginning, I don't think I mentioned it. She's like, you got to let go. Is this a, a physical let go of that rock to go down to the sword? Or was this a... Let go would have of any feelings of being a friend to Catra. Is this is that the duality of it? She lets go and she falls into the pit. Why didn't the episode end right there? But that's so powerful because we don't know what she meant. I'm thinking she but is that a good thing to give up on someone to literally say this person is unredeemable? I, I don't think that's the right lesson. I it it's it kind of reminds me of a lot in Last Airbender, when Aang went to his past selves and he's asked, what do I do about the Fire Lord? I, I, I'm i a monk. I, I don't want to kill him. Is there anything I can do? And then every other avatar is like, bro, you got to kill that dude. I don't care what you feel like. I don't care if you feel like it's the wrong thing to do. The world would be better if you just kill him. He even goes back to, uh, what's her, Young, Young Shang, uh, the female monk. And she's like, oh, he's, he's thinking, oh, this, the, the, she's a monk. I'm a monk. She's going to understand me. And, and she lays it down. She's like, for him and tells him, hey, we're both monks, but being the avatar comes first. And being the avatar means doing things that you may not agree with, but it's for the better of the world because the avatar isn't just for you. The avatar is for the world. And then she kind of says in not so many words, even me, the, a, a fellow monk, I would kill him. So is this what uh, Bright uh, Light Hope is telling her? That she needs to let go of caring about Catra, uh, let go of the the hope of maybe bringing her to the good side man that that's deep because this is that she came for guidance and this is the guidance she's getting and it's gonna just totally break her heart ah she lets you know like i said she lets go and falls and by god why didn't the episode end right there we cut to in chapter right? and uh, uh scorpion uh scorpio I, I don't remember her name scissor punch i that's what i will remember for all time and eternity and they're just goofing off and she's like, did I tell you the time about me and Catra on a boat? And she's like, oh, she did tape recorder. And she goes, yeah, you did tell me. Ha, ha, ha. They're goofing. I know this was a heavy episode, so they wanted to bring in comedy. But you don't have to. You don't have to bring the funny. You can just let something just be good. So they have this funny little moment, and Catra gets back. And it's, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, scissor punch is all, uh, oh, you're filthy. <laughs> That's like the first thing she tells her. She's like, oh, are you hurt? Can I help you? Do you need to be snuggled and everything? And it's like, no, the, no, she doesn't need that right now. She, it's totally, she's somewhere else. She's so 
she's physically there, but her heart and her soul are some somewhere else. And then she's like, remember we talked about personal space back off? She turns around and <laughs> chapters right there all up in her personal space. She, she wants that first tech that, you know, did you bring back anything for me? Did you bring me any goodies? And Katra, and again, I'm kind of a funny joke. They did this gag a couple times in the last episode. She's like, what are you doing out of your restraints? She's like, oh yeah, she runs back over to the wall and like puts herself back in the, the chains or whatever. And uh, she gives her another one of those discs. And again, it's all technology. I wish it was just magic, but whatever. She's like, oh, I, we, we could be on this. And then, and Chaptra starts dancing with uh, Scorpion Lady. And it's like, oh, why are they being so silly? And she's like, okay, do whatever the hell you guys want to do. Just keep it down. I'm going to bed. She walks into her room and door shut. Episode ends. I, I, it's just a good episode. It's, I can't believe whoever wrote this, or storyboarded this, everything, have them do more episodes. This was, uh, it's, this is their, uh, shining jewel of, the, if there was a crown of episodes, this is the, the, the jewel that's in the center, the thing you, your eye gets drawn to, this should be celebrated. Everyone, uh, before, I, I didn't watch any reviews leading up to this when, when it first came out, and just like reading headlines, of course, from all the stupid websites like Vox and Kutaku and, you know, all these kind of very SJW type sites, oh, the, the, get the Princess Prom episode. It's everything uh, we've always wanted in a cartoon. And that sucked. Why weren't they talking about this episode? They should have been saying, hey guys, the show, it's um, it's for a younger audience and everything. But when you get to episode 11, is that where I'm at? Episode 11. That's when you get, whoa, there's so much more that can be told in this world. They did such a good job. I don't know if it's because I watched so much mediocrity leading up to this, but I really, really like this episode. Give it a number. Um, it did have the animation does drop here and there, but the music's really good. The fight scene was a little lame, but the story, the framing, the the different uh, storytelling devices. Damn, got eight out of ten, a B. I I can't believe it. I didn't think it was gonna happen, but wow. Um, I wasn't going to do this review. It's like super early in the morning for me right now. I was going to just watch it and go to bed, but I, I was excited. I wanted to talk about it. It's, I can't believe it. It's a good episode. If you're going to watch one episode, make it this episode. This, this is what the whole show could have been like with serious moments, a, a long string of serious moments without having to throw a silly joke in every 30 seconds. It was pretty dang good. Uh, I feel bad for both characters. I feel bad for Adora. Having to, if that's what she's supposed to do, is let go of Katra. I feel bad for Katra because she was right there. She was teeter tartering on joining Adora and being and letting herself become that better person she can be because she knows she's a good person deep inside. Because in the last episode, she showed sympathy for the woman that basically abused her, her whole life. But when she saw her down and out, and you know, she looked like she was very beat up, and she showed a little bit of sympathy. So there is goodness in Katra. But she might have just killed it. She might have just destroyed whatever goodness was left. And I don't, I don't like when that happens to a character. It's great storytelling, but I actually feel bad for the character. This damn show made me feel bad for the freaking characters. I can't believe they did it. I, <laughs> I'm, probably, I'm probably over a half hour. I, I'm not, I don't even know how much long I've been talking. But th there you go, guys. I'm honest. I am not going to lie. I'm not going to hate something just because I had preconceptions about it. This completely blew me away from my what I came into it from the previous 10 episodes. Bravo. Let's give you a clap. You did it. You made a good episode. Well, is there any more? I don't know. But you actually made one actual excellent episode. Crimson Sin here. Thanks for watching and be sure to like, sub, and share. Also, for the most up-to-date information about the podcast, follow us on Twitter at C15Podcast.